Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you're here at the session uh, 2 p.m. on ranked choice voting and proportional representation. Um, so I've, we ask people to be on mute while the speakers are talking, and there'll be plenty of time for question and answer. So I will turn it over to our first speaker, Howie Hawkins. Thank you, Gloria. And just brief introduction, I was the Green Party candidate for president in 2020. And I just put some information in the chat that's background to my opening remarks. And what I wanna do is put the primary topic today of ranked choice voting, particularly proportional representation in the context of this democracy crisis we're in. So the resources are some demands uh, I think we should be raising. There's a resource paper that links to legislation and background information. I did a release blasting Biden for not even talking about the filibuster in his so-called voting rights speech in Philly earlier this week. And then an article I've been working on just came out today in Tempest on how ranked choice voting proportional representation is how the left's gonna escape our electoral impact. So that is there for you to copy and look at. But I got five points I wanna, wanna say in the next 10 minutes. And the first thing is, and we all know this, the Republicans are entrenching their minority rule with these state voter suppression and election, left, election theft laws that they're getting passed. And the Democrats can't get their act together to stop them. That's why, you know, the filibuster. So the feckless Democrats are getting rolled by the ruthless Republicans and our democracy's escaping us. And I mentioned, you know, Biden didn't even mention the filibuster in his speech the other day. I mean, are they serious? I think this makes the Democrats complicit in the assault on voting rights and honest elections. And so, you know, we had objections to the partial public campaign financing through matching funds that was in the For the People Act. But that's the act that can secure voting rights because federal it's in the Constitution. Congress can regulate how the states administer elections. And without those protections, they're making it harder for people to vote. And what's getting less attention, the Republicans are setting it up so they can steal elections. They have taken the power from, in some of these laws they passed from independently elected secretaries of state, from bipartisan county boards of election, and put it in Republican controlled legislatures to determine the outcomes of elections. And already in Georgia, they are purging particularly black Democrats from county boards of election. So this is going on. And in the partisan gerrymandering, which the For the People Act would have stopped, is about to uh, go when the census data gets to the states on August 15th. But the Republicans already got their plans. Experts say they're gonna be able to get 15 to 20 more seats in the House in 2022. All the other, you know, just because of gerrymandering. This is, this is what I'm it, talking about. Somebody needs to uh, mute, please. So the Democrats only have a four seat majority. So they're going to lose the House and whatever, you know, little reforms they were talking about, the DREAM Act, the PRO Act, the Equality Act, $15 minimum wage. None of that's going to happen. It's not like it's going to happen even now. But after that, all bets are off. So the Republicans are enhancing minority rule, which they get through gerrymandering and counter-majoritarian institutions like the US Senate and the Electoral College. And they're setting it up to do in 2024 what they tried to do this year, deny states where they lost the election, their electoral votes, and steal the 2024 presidential election. So that's the first point. We got a democracy crisis. Now the problem for the Greens is, more than ever, we face the spoiler problem because the Republicans are no longer just a conservative party. They're an extremist party of racism and autocracy. So progressive-minded people are more inclined than ever to vote defensively for the Democrats to stop the Republicans under our single member plurality voting system. That makes it harder than ever for the Greens to run can, uh, campaigns and get votes and win elections. I know, That's huh? That's why we need to prioritize ranked choice voting 
and proportional representation. Please, and I'm oh, sorry, Howie. Please, everyone, everyone, please mute while our speakers are talking. Thank you. Sorry, Howie. Yeah, we really have to attack head on the single member district winner take all system because not only does it create the incentives for lesser illegal voting and entrench the two party system, it's exclusionary. Only the plurality in a district gets represented. And 90% of our house districts and 95% of our state legislative districts and most of our local municipal districts are one party districts because in any one of those single member districts, one party has a majority. That's why usually the biggest vote is the non vote because people know they can't change anything. We got to take that head on because it's fundamentally anti democratic and exclusionary. And the only way we're going to break through in these circumstances is by changing the rules and going to proportional representation. I said a lot during the presidential campaign, we can duplicate what we've done in local levels. We have over 100 elected officials. We could elect thousands going into the 2020s, but we don't have time. I mean, that's been done before. The abolitionists, the free soilers leading in the Republican party, the populist movement in the late 1800s, the socialist movement in the early 20th century, they got to the point where they were electing thousands of people to local office, hundreds of state legislatures and dozens, particularly uh, in the 30s, by the 30s, uh, it was some of these third parties to Congress. And, uh, but that took decades. We don't have decades with the climate crisis, the nuclear arms race, and the inequality that kills people right now. Our life expectancies are going down. So we need proportional representation to open up the, uh, the political system for us and everybody else who's excluded. I mean, even if you're a Democrat in a majority Republican district or Republican in majority Democratic district, you don't get representation. It's fundamentally anti-democratic, and we got to attack the Democrats on that because they are vote suppressors too. Party suppression is a form of voter suppression. 61% of Jill Stein's vote in 2016, according to exit polls, would have stayed home if she was not on the ballot. So when you suppress the Green Party, you're suppressing voters. Suppressing parties is what autocratic states do. And the Democrats specialize, it, specialize in that in the United States. We got clobbered by the Democrats here in New York. We're off the ballot. They tripled ballot access requirements. They just passed a law in Nevada aimed directly at the, Demo at the Greens by the Democrats, according to Richard Winger at Ballot Access News. And then, you know, in our campaign, the votes on whether we would stay on the ballot in the states where we were knocked off, Montana, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, were strictly partisan. Democratic hack judges knocked us off the ballot, disregarding the facts and the law. So this is a crooked system. And what we got to do is go into campaigns and put it to the Democrats. Well, I'm getting ahead of my point. I want to say briefly on these seven demands. The right to a uh, or the right to vote amendment to the US Constitution. If you remember Bush v. Gore, the Supreme said you don't have a constitutional right to vote. There's some, you know, in the constitution it says you can't discriminate on the basis of race, or on sex, but you don't have the right to vote. Without that right to vote, it's hard to enforce voting rights laws. So that's one thing. Nonpartisan election administration. That's what the Republicans are really attacking. But what other country in the world has the two governing parties administering their own elections? Every other credible the democracy in the world has an independent agency. So that's a demand fair ballot access. There has not been congressional legislation to make federal standards for fair ballot access uh, since John Conyers dropped the bill he had in there for a decade. Pretty good bill after Nader quote unquote spoiled the 2000 election. I think we need to shop around, find some progressive, write a bill for them and rally around that. That's crucial because getting on the ballot, if you're not on the ballot, you're not really in the election. And in proportional representation, and I think a major point of our presentations today is ranked choice voting solves a spoiler problem in single seat races, like for executive offices. But we got to have multi member RCV to get proportional representation in legislative bodies. And there's a big movement now for RCV, it's gaining momentum, but not everybody's for multi member districts RCV. And that's, that's where the Greens got to play a big role. Abolition of the Senate. 
if you read the amendment uh, article, Article 5 of the Constitution, it says you can't change the Senate without the unanimous consent of all the states. There's not really a constitutional channel to do that. But I still think we should raise the demand because it shows how counter majoritarian our system of government is and gives impetus and urgency to these other reforms. Abolition of the Electoral College and presidential elections by majority popular vote or a ranked choice national popular vote. There's an article coming out, Rob Ritchie at Fair Vote and some others gonna have in uh, the Harvard Policy and Law Review soon. And they make the case that we don't need to amend the constitution to do this. We can pass a federal law under provisions already in the constitution to set up a national ranked choice popular vote for president. When that comes out, they have legislation drafted in that article. I think one thing Green should do is shop that around and make that something we can rally around as well. And in public financing of public elections, this is where our objection to the, you know, for the People Act, because the matching fund system actually magnifies the disparities between people who qualify, if you can qualify, and we should be for full public financing with no private money. Public elections should be publicly financed. Ironically, that was in Biden's platform, still up there on the net. Of course, the next paragraph said, well, if we can't get the constitutional amendment passed, we'll go with the matching funds and for the People Act. So I don't know how serious it was, but he felt compelled to put that in there. I think that's kind of intuitive for people uh, and that should be our demand there. But these are things we should be raising, I think as part of a broader pro-democracy agenda. The Democrats are failing. It's an opportunity for us to step up, but the top priority should be fair ballot access legislation, proportional representation, and then a ranked choice national popular vote for president. So my, my fifth point is, Green candidates need to make these a priority in the coming period. You know, the Democrats are autocrats. If they don't get with us for fair ballot access laws and proportional representation, because they're for party suppression and they're for this exclusionary single member plurality voting system. And we got to call them out on that. They're not progressives, they're not even small d Democrats. They are supporting an autocratic system and it's time to really take that head on. And we can, of course, do that in congressional elections. At the state level, we can talk about fair ballot access as well. And even at the local level, we can push and really should, and we can win now, and we are winning, ranked choice voting and proportional representation. So to conclude, you know, Angela Walker and I ran on three themes around life or death issues. The Eco-Socialist Green New Deal to deal with the climate crisis, the Economic Bill of Rights to deal with the inequality crisis, and peace initiatives to deal with the new nuclear arms race and the endless wars. But I think if we were running today, we'd have a fourth theme, and that would be these democracy demands. And we would lead with them because without democracy, we can't get the power to deal with these life or death issues. So I urge us all to put this at the top of our list. Um, I think this is how we take on both the Democrats and Republicans in this democracy crisis. We can't let the Democrats off the hook. You know, the Republicans, everybody can see what they're doing, but we're the ones that got to show what the Democrats are doing in terms of ballot access and defending this single member plurality system that's exclusionary. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Linda Templin of the Colorado Green. She's executive director of Ranked Choice Voting for Colorado, who's going to explain in more detail what proportional or what RCV is, proportional RCV and, and how it works. So it's yours, Linda. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. I have been doing this work since I joined the Greens in 2016, because if we can't win seats, these are all great ideas that will never get done. And as Jill Stein spelled out very clearly in 2016, this is a matter of survival for us as a species. So this is, I'm gonna go over what we've been doing here in Colorado to advance proportional representation. So I'm gonna do a um, share the slides because some of this is some tech talk and um, it often needs um, the visuals. So uh, the two things that ranked choice voting does for minor parties is it is one, a pathway to major party status which means we get on the ballot. 
and it's also a pathway to electoral wins. So, um, let me, there we go. All right, so here's, here's what I'm gonna uh, dig through is um, the definition of ranked choice has to be baked in that it is only instant runoff voting for single winner elections and only single transferable vote for proportional representation in multi-winner districts. So get it baked in early. And I'm gonna go over, and this is gonna be the bulk of what I'm talking about, just going through exactly how the method works because it is truly one voting method. It just got stuck with different names due to um, scholars having debates back in the 1800s. So that's not today's stuff. We stick with the voter-centered language ranked choice voting. So, uh, and I'm gonna go over what a uh, single winner and what proportional representation does for minor parties. And then, um, you know, this is a late stage capitalism problem. There is money that comes into the activism to promote fake reforms. So I'm gonna go over some of those as like the red flags of what you look out for in your state. And um, so there's that. And then I'm gonna go uh, quickly over some voter education, which is super easy, right? So we know that getting into the weeds gets people confused and when confused people say no. So uh, clarity is a huge thing with voter education and truly as, um, Fair Vote Minnesota has been doing for decades now. They do voter education and it handles both single winner and proportional representation. It works fine. Voters don't care what's on the back end of it. They don't, they just wanna handle their ballots. So that's what I'm gonna uh, spin through. So real quick, just the history of this is that it was invented, by, um, Ranked choice was invented back in the 1830s for proportional representation. And I'll drop these slides in the chat. There's a lot of yatter in here that we don't have to go through. Um, so it was invented back in the 1800s for the purpose of proportional representation. The single winner version was developed later in the 1800s to handle single winner races. And it has been used in the, uh, ranked choice has been used in the U.S. since 1915. So there is a wealth of data on it, and there is um, it, it has been proven in the courts to be what works. So it goes up on challenges, and it gets dismissed on summary judgment, which is huge. It's in Robert's Rules of Order as um, own the second best method to use instead of in-person balloting. And this is a point that works well for our um, conservative audiences. Um, there was uh, a wave of experiments with different voting methods. Um, yes, the scholars are sure ranked choice is what works. Uh, and then there were repeals based on civil rights activists winning seats in Cincinnati and based on a communist winning a seat in New York City. So that was, um, you know, as you all know, the Democrats were um, against civil rights until they claimed to have invented them. You know, it's one of those things. Once they realize they can't win with their thing, they'll pretend they invented the reform. Um, so, and then now we have, uh, from the 1990s on, we have a modern wave of, you know, the, these, this progressive reform. So, um, and here's a, a quick example of how it is um, you get it baked into the rules. The Colorado Secretary of State, and this was a Republican, uh, baked it in that it is, only instant runoff voting, which is the old fashioned name for single winner. And it is only single transferable vote, again, old fashioned name for proportional representation. And this has been, um, we've been working with the Secretary of State's office 
making sure they get everything they need for a successful rollout. So you don't have like a New York City situation where suddenly, you know, they don't know when to re release results or handle things. Um, so I would say, you know, Colorado leads the nation, and this is obviously not our doing. Colorado leads the nation in um, voter centered election reform. So the other states look to Colorado. So uh, here's the the link to the rule. This is what you would say to your state. These are the rules for ranked choice voting. Okay. Um, now here is the weeds and this is the worst it gets. Okay. Okay. Which is the threshold formula is always the same in a ranked choice race. So that is uh, one over the number of winners plus one. So for instance, and I'm going to go different than the slides here. In a single winner race, it's one, one winner plus one. So it's one over two, 50%. And that's how you get, uh, you know, the community consensus there. Well, in a three winner race, uh, it has, um, you know, you need a quarter of the votes to win. So this is a huge point because what it does is in, is that it provides, um, I'm just bopping ahead to a, a, a graphic here, it provides proportional representation. So if about a third of the people are prefer green policies, then about a third of the seats go to the greens. That's essentially how it works. And that's how we're currently getting blocked out by, um, by the single winner, winner take all races. So, and this is a few things in political science are considered a law, but it is here, DeVazier's law, single ballot plurality rule elections within single member districts, which is what we have in most places, it favors a two party system. And that's why we have the Demopublican Tweedledee Tweedledum system. So, and a quick review, and this, this is the thing, the, uh, Republicans love is, you know, you point to Ross Perot uh, because, you know, it's important to get the rank and file from all over the political spectrum. So that means you point at this election, Bill Clinton didn't necessarily deserve that win. Um, and it limits political competition. Now, what single winner rank choice is going to do for us is again, allow us to pick up enough votes to qualify as a major party in state party elections. So um, let's see, and then we're gonna go to, here's what happens um, for a single winner race. And please pardon the colors, this was put together by a Democrat. Uh, you know, you have, um, you know, a mixed group of he people here represented by different shades of yellow and green. And, um, you know, yet you've got all these diversity of opinions, yet you get a single party rule in many places. And you only, people have to pick between the lesser of two evils still, or that's what it produces is a uh, two party system. So we don't want that in the long term. We want to move towards proportional representation. It's also known as multi-member districts. So that is um, why we need to do that. Uh, a quick um, step ahead to uh, an alliance alert, alert. Conservatives usually favor proportional representation. This has been historically the fact since the 1800s. Um, here is an excellent paper that was put out in, I wanna say March, uh, by the Independence Institute. So we have a link here and it puts forth the conservative case for um, proportional representation. And indeed, when I spoke with the um, Republican Party's executive committee, they loved the idea of proportional representation because it guarantees them a seat because they're getting boxed out by the Democrats in Colorado, just like they used to box out the, uh, the Democrats. So they know that um, this system is not working out for them and that they need to get on board with this. 
Um, we also have um, another ally here is that um, county party or the county parties, because often the state parties will hem and haw and you know, do what the national tells them, but the county parties are key allies here because they're often irrelevant based on the urban rural divide. So if you're a Democrat in, in a, a rural area, you have no voice. Similarly, if you are a Republican in a uh, metropolitan area, you have no voice. So these are excellent allies. Um, and also the clerks and administrators, and I know in other states they have fought against ranked choice. There will always be some who say, I don't wanna do it, it's extra work. Fair and valid, right? They are busy people. We will find allies within the administration, particularly at your Secretary of State's office. These are the nonpartisan people who are in through the current um, system, and they so they're not beholden to a political party. Or you know, when administrations change, they don't. So these folks are the ones who will speak up at policy meetings and say, that's not fair to the minor parties. That's not fair to independents. They'll get it out of their mouths before I can get it out of my mouth. So these are key, key uh, allies. This is how we were able to get it um, proportional representation baked into the Colorado rules. So um, let's see, so this is, this is me going back to a point I already made, single winner. This is just an example of voter education. And this is the um, Clinton Bush Perot race. So we have Clinton winning here. And if the if Perot had been eliminated, then um, most the odds are that uh, most of those votes would have gone over to Bush. And that would have changed the history of the Democratic Party. They wouldn't have scooch to the right quite as far or as um, solidly as they did with Clinton. Um, and this is as much detail as voters will put up with. This is what activists will put up with is this level of chart and they still don't like it. People like to see the ballots. Now here are the results. So in a single winner race, and this is what we've, um, you know, it's a short term sacrifice for the Greens it's a short-term sacrifice to go with single winner because there are some Greens around the country who have lucked into office um, by getting a plurality win. So here's an example of a Republican in Fort Collins um, winning with 30% of the votes. And then these are all Bernie Kratt type um, folks who did not win. And likely this is an unearned win. Um, now this is, here's the ballot. This is what it was like in Santa Fe. This is how they were able to prove up. This is from Center for Civic Design. They have excellent voter education materials. Um, now what they're able to do for a single winner race is you can prove up where the consensus was of the community. And, you know, as far as many people saying that if they'd used ranked choice in the primaries, it would have been Warren winning. Well, the point is to a larger election, you have Greens and socialists in the race to move that conversation. You might end up with a Bernie winner, but that's the only way the Bernie folk are going to get ahead is to have the Greens and the socialists part of the conversation because that then changes the Overton window of what you can and can't talk about. But here's the quick run through for folk who are not familiar with ranked choice. Um, people, what they do is on their ballots, they rank their choices. So most places have a grid style ballot. So we use a grid style ballot. And this is um, what it looked like in Santa Fe. So you put your first choice in the first column. So, um, and then your second choice in the second and so on. So it's who you love, who you like, who you can live with. If you can't stand them, don't even vote for them at all. You will still be heard for saying, hex no on that person. And if you only want one, one person, you can do that too. And you are heard as saying, you know, if my person is eliminated, I throw my hands up in the air and say, the rest of y'all are equally idiotic. I wash my hands. 
You, and that is a valid thing to be heard saying. So you can do that too under this system. So that's how the ballot works. Here's how you, they show you the winners. Um, and you can see, and this is, this is what your average voter will look at at the end of the election. They'll say, oh, look, Alan Weber had the consensus. Okay, uh, you know, biggest runner up was Trujillo. Now this is how the tally works. Now this is what it looks like on election night is you count up all the first choices. Now, half of the time, somebody wins in the first round. So not interesting for our purposes of illustrating how ranked choice works. So what happens here is uh, we see that it's going to go to what they call the instant runoff. Um, so that means they have to wait for the last of the absentee ballots to come in, the last of the mail ballots to come in. You know, it's not on election night, it's when they get it dialed down to having all the ballots together. So um, in Colorado, that's 10 days. So 10 days later, so we know what they tell you on election night is Alan Weber is the leader. He is most likely to be the winner. There could be an upset. We don't know, we'll get it squared away and nobody has to go uh, around saying later, oh, well, he didn't deserve that win because all these other people were in the race, you know. Um, it gets squared away and you can understand who really earned it. So here's what happens is you eliminate the candidate with the fewest choices. So we see Peter Ives here is eliminated, but not those voters. We want to know what they think. Now, uh, 140 people, three people said, I wash my hands. I give up on the rest of y'all idiots. Fair. They said that but they're no longer part of the final tally. That's why it's a percentage, not a hard number. And this is an imperfection in the system. Perfection has not been uh, you know, found in the mortal realm. And this is how we get it to close enough and done, right? So we just say it's a majority of who, the consensus of a majority. All right, that nerd bit is done. Uh, so what we do is we look back at Peter Ives' ballots and we say, you know, if you can't have Peter Ives, who do you want instead? And we see that many of them said Weber and many of them said Noble. So that's how the biggest part of the split went. Okay, so they're heard saying that and it goes kind of up from the bottom. It goes from the least popular candidate with the fewest votes on up because we want to give each candidate as much of a chance to win as possible. That's why we do it that way. So we now have Maestas as the one with the fewest votes. And we see those get uh, transferred to their next choice, their next active choice. So if you voted Ives, he's not in the race, but your ballot is still counted if you voted for one of these others. Okie dokie. So we got that. We still don't have a majority, so we're going to, and it's super close between Trujillo and Noble. Um, but we see that Noble and uh, Weber are very similar candidates based on how many of the transfer votes they get. So, uh, sorry, Katie Noble, she gets eliminated, and we see most of those votes go over to Alan Weber. And we know that he has earned the win. Now, what this does for Weber when he's in office, ideally, is that he has to clean out his ear holes and see, look, I didn't get a win in the first round. My platform is not that strong. I need to listen to these Katie Noble voters to whom I owe my win. I wouldn't have been able to take the win without that block of support. I have to see where my support came from as part of a winning coalition. So that is single winner, breathe and out. Okay, congratulations for getting through that nerdapalooza. Alrighty, so uh, multi-winner, same hecking ballot, right? Same thing. So that's all voters care about. But here's our example here, um, is what happens in, the, in this election is you just tell people, um, you know, after the election's over, you just say who won. Voters do not care about these weeds. It's just the political nerd of the world. Okay, so in this example, you see it works just like 
um, the single winner version. So no candidate has a majority. Okay, so we're gonna eliminate the one with the fewest votes. All right, so we have those getting transferred and we got a winner, Betsy Perez. Now, here's what's different. This, she has more support than she needs. So this is, this is the genius of the system. You don't have to say, well, Betsy, as a voter, you don't have to say, well, Betsy Perez is so popular. I don't wanna waste my vote by voting for her. So I'm gonna vote for somebody else. No, you don't have to think into it at that level. You just say the truth of what you want. So if your vote goes to Betsy Perez, we see that she's got 15 extra votes. What those do is they, those 15 extra votes and they're chosen randomly, but they get transferred to their second choice. So it's not that you have an extra vote, it's just that your support was in excess of what was needed. So it's gonna go to your next choice because we don't wanna exclude you from the final decision. So that's how it works. So the surplus, we call those the surplus votes, those get transferred. Okay, so it is then just wash and repeat. Um, we see she, those votes go to Mary Chan and Steve Lorenzo. And then Mary Chan takes the win, her surplus votes go to Steve Lorenzo. So that's how we find a consensus of the majority. And we see who earned a win in a multi-winner race. Okay. So you have now survived a college level class on how the heck that works. Um, and again, most of these things are not things regular voters care about. What they care about is how to work their ballots and they will care about coalition support. So let's say a environmental organization will say, vote for this green number one, vote for this independent number two. You know, they will rank the choices and that'll help determine who gets the win? But on your ballot, you say, or, or on your um, campaign materials, you put your name and then number one. So it's Linda Templin, number one. And that lets them know I want the first ranking. And then when I'm out campaigning, I'll say, rank me number one. But if you can't, then consider this independent candidate who also cares about fracking. You know, do it that way. And that alerts the voters on how you're going to aggregate a consensus win. So that's the bulk of it. So to go real quick into now, here are the fake reforms that are getting uh, put out there because what can I say? The people with the money do not like the poor's getting uh, control. So there is um, one fake reform getting trotted out. It's in, um, it's getting used in Utah now. It used to be used in Louisiana. It's called block preferential. There are organizations, and I will call these organizations frenemies because they are often useful, but then they do this nonsense where they push block preferential and then include it in their like list of cities that have ranked choice. So you gotta look for the fly in the ointment there on the, um, on the fair vote maps. Uh, our, our frenemies at Fair Vote. So what it does is it favors the largest party. So there are scholars putting out papers on how this is trash. And so what's happening in Utah is that this is a, um, uh, a pilot and they're going to discover that block preferential is trash and then they'll, you know, knock on wood, get, um, uh, move it to block uh, to um, proportional representation. Okay, so moving along right quick. Uh, that's a FOB. There's final five voting, and that's what got passed in Alaska. They uh, that was um, Catherine Gale at um, Democracy Found, and uh, it looks like ranked choice because they pass ranked choice, but then it also has a final five or a final four primary. It is a, you know, a Wild West or a jungle primary that is a, a sing, it is a pick one plurality election. And 
so you don't have to have any type of a majority. There's no con community consensus built into it. And it also limits competition because the independents and the minor parties are not going to have the money to get the names out there in the, um, in the primaries. And this blocks the minor parties out of the general election. It is trash. There's a few other fobs and I'm pretty much done. Uh, grand Junction voting, and I'll drop the, um, the board account, approval and star. Yes, we've done the research. Yes, there are those political scientists who are telling us we're getting it right. Yes, we have an annual review of methods. I'll um, drop some information about that into the chat if you all want to participate. What we do nationwide is look at all these states that already have some form of um, ranked choice being instant runoff or single transferable for proportional representation. These are all the places that are getting ready for when we have national RCV for president. These are the places where it's getting cooked in or it's already part of how the administrators run their elections. So again, this is all the voters care about. We talk about cookies because everybody likes them and wants to talk about cookies and it's never too hot or cold for cookies. So we talk about that. This is what the voters care about. They know it's easy, um, it's proven. So if you need to have a Bible to thump, if you will, I will point to uh, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop by Lee Drutman, who is um, uh, a key um, scholarly ally in the um, fight for proportional representation. And again, I'll, I'll drop the links in the chat um, that includes our timeline on when we're planning to get it in Colorado. With that, I will pass it on because I am really looking forward to hearing what's going on in Florida. Thank you so much, Linda, for that presentation, for that uh, explainer. And um, yes, my name is Lebo Padnu. I uh, am proud to serve as the male co-chair of the Green Party of Florida. Um, Florida, as you may guess, is politically somewhat different um, than things are in uh, Colorado. So we have to start from a little bit further back. Um, right now, we're still spreading the word on ranked choice voting before we can even begin to talk about multi-member districts. To give you an idea of what the situation is like here in Florida, I had uh, the honor to run for office in 2018. And 2018 was kind of a fiasco here in South Florida. I'm in Palm Beach County, the same county as Mar-a-Lago. Um, and there was, you may remember, some delays in returning the results. As a result of that, our uh, governor, Ron DeSantis, a Republican, replaced our county's supervisor of elections, which is normally an elected position, with someone that he handpicked. Um, shortly after she was put in office, I went to introduce myself to her as I am the was I'm also the co chair of the Palm Beach County Greens. So as the co chair of a county party, I felt I should know her. We sat and had a nice conversation for about half an hour. She asked me some of my concerns. And one of them I mentioned was uh, ranked choice voting. And the response I got from our supervisor elections was uh, what is that. So here in Florida, we uh, have some work to do in teaching people about um, ranked choice voting. And uh, we've been putting that work in, and I kind of want to tell you that story. Um, in 2020, well, in Florida, the, we have no way of citizens for putting laws into effect statewide, except through our constitution. Um, there's a long, arduous process that will allow you to put an amendment on the constitution as a citizen. You spend a lot of money and get a lot of signatures. Um, but other than that, we can't just do ballot initiatives for normal laws. Um, an ally of our former governor, um, Rick Scott, who's now a right-wing Republican senator that you probably all know of, got an initiative on the ballot in 2020 to try to pass as a, um, as a um, constitutional amendment that we would have open primaries, so-called open primaries. Um, and for those of you who know, open primaries are a poison pen. They destroy um, smaller political parties. And lo and behold, um, the, the libertarians are also against that. So one of our local parties, the Duval party, reached out to their uh, local libertarian party and got together to have a meeting to see what they could do to oppose this amendment. 
And um, both locals called in their chairs to this meeting, and we decided to do a statewide alliance between the Libertarians and the Greens to oppose this amendment, and the amendment um, lost narrowly. Um, so when we continued to discuss, we talked about what more we might be able to agree on. It turns out that the Libertarian Party of Florida is strongly in face in favor of ranked choice voting. So we decided to continue to work together on ranked choice voting to see what we could accomplish. Um, a little more background on Florida politics. Most of you probably have heard the news that we um, went to Trump in the 2020 election. About two thirds of our state legislature is run by the um, Republicans and every statewide office except for the Secretary of Agriculture is held by the Republicans. In spite of that, as someone who has to parse voter records every month, in the 14 years I've lived in Florida, there's never been a time where there are more registered Republicans than Democrats. We've always had more registered Democrats than Republicans. That's how bad our electoral system is, that the Republicans have a stranglehold on every level of state government in a state that has more Democrats than Republicans. So when the Libertarians and the Greens got together and decided to work together, we were contacted by an organization called Rank the Vote. Um, and uh, we formed a, uh, a nonprofit and decided that the first mission of us was to educate the public of Florida on ranked choice voting. There's no way that we can get anything passed on the state level, on the local level without further education. So we then uh, began the process of founding a 501c3 and looking for other allies that we could work with. Um, we came up with a name for the organization, and uh, we uh, started having regular meetings. And I want to, once again want to point out the importance of when we have the Green Party has something as golden as um, ranked choice voting, something that we've been pushing for decades when no one else is talking about it. And I do believe that the Green New Deal is going to be the next thing like that, the next you know thing that is going to receive general consensus when people hear about it. That started here in the Green Party, and we have to thank people like Howie Hawkins, um, um, Jill Stein. Uh, Ralph Nader, Cynthia McKinney, et cetera, for helping to have these discussions so that now I can help to found this organization with the Greens, with the Libertarians. We have, member, we have members who um, worked on Republican campaigns. We have Democrats across the political spectrum of those who are aware of what's going on in their state and with their politics, recognizing the need for ranked choice voting across the state. Um, <clears throat> over time, as we started to build coalitions, we worked with another organization called Rank My Vote. And Rank My Vote had uh, has been around for a while and they work on a slightly different um, idea. They believe they believe that it's time to strike now. Was we believe that people need to be educated. They've always believed that it's time to strike now. They worked very hard in Sarasota, Florida. And if we look at Linda's map and see um, that Florida has a color that is not just pure white, Sarasota is probably the reason for that. Um, Sarasota passed by ballot, local ballot initiative, ranked choice voting several years ago. Unfortunately, they've not been able to implement it for, due to roadblocks that have been thrown up by the voting machine companies and now by our Secretary of State, who has hinted that maybe he believes that it is unconstitutional. But we'll get more to that uh, later. So um, through just grassroots organizing, we went out and we spoke to, uh, we've been speaking to groups around the political spectrum, the League of Women Voters, uh, the DSA, um, the Mises Caucus of the Libertarians, and we're getting more and more speakers and doing more and more education. But we've also been working closely with another organization called Rank My Vote Florida. And Rank My Vote Florida, as I said, was very involved in the win in Sarasota. And they've been working very much on the local level. And they are a 501c4. For those who don't know, 501c3, which the organization I spoke with earlier has, um, restricts you largely to education. Um, your spending on um, ballot initiatives, on candidates and things like that is going to be restricted. 501c4 is more allowing you to do political spending and the donations made to an organization like that are going to be tax exempt. Um, I know this is a little bit nitty gritty, but this is, I believe, the room for that because you need to know that your state's going to be different and the wins that happen in one state, they're gonna be need to be done in a different way in another state. Um, you know, you may be able to have ballot initiatives that allow you to pass statewide laws that make these determinations. We can't do that. We've got to get a constitutional amendment that has to go through our Supreme Court it has to get uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of signatures, et cetera. So we have to come in at, at a different level. So um, through the work, working together with uh, Better About Florida, uh, the organization for Libertarians and Greens started and Rank My Vote, we've decided to bring this 501c3 and this 501c4 together um, to have uh, two closely knit uh, sister organizations that can work together 
and um, may stay on the right side of election and campaign financing laws and things like that, but at the same time um, have different tracks. Because as while my supervisor of elections may know nothing about ranked choice voting, at the same time, um, there's a municipality here in Florida uh, by the name of Clearwater that had an election where a city commissioner won with 27% of the vote. And these are the kinds of outrageous things that can happen that can actually wake people up. So as a result of that, um, the city of Clearwater reached out to us and um, asked us to explain uh, ranked choice voting to them. And the city of Clearwater uh, decided that they're gonna put ranked choice voting on the ballot in March of 2022. Um, so that could be a win if we start seeing municipal, uh, uh, municipalities begin to adopt them. Um, the city of Gainesville um, also unanimously uh, adopted a resolution to support ranked choice voting, and they intend to put it on the ballot in November of 2022. Um, one of our organizations actually helped to draft that resolution. Um, one of the two organizations has recently won the Accelerator Award from Represent.us and Unite America. And um, we are working on uh, bringing uh, comprehensive legislation to uh, different cities and counties, um, depending on how our laws are based. Meanwhile, we are pressuring our Secretary of State to um, come out with an actual legal decision on whether county level rate choice voting would be legal or not. We hope to grow this organization by starting at the grassroots level, by continuing to educate people, and then hopefully at some point being able to make the whole state a rate choice voting state. Um, did I miss anything that I wanted to join in? I do want to point out um, the name of the organization, um, the we have decided to come together under one moniker, and that is RankMyVoteFlorida.org. And um, there you can join up, sign up, and get our newsletter and find out um, what we're doing here. And also, I think I have a few minutes left. How am I doing on time here? You got about a minute, but you can have a couple extra minutes because Howie and Linda did. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, Part of what this came out of, and I think that this is this goes uh, to the spirit of what we're talking about, is um, what can green, green parties do, especially green parties like us, when um, we have a lot of difficulty in the electoral um, um, space. And that was a problem that we faced in 2020. Going into 2020, we had a single candidate running for office, and that candidate was a writing candidate. And that was in the 2020 cycle when Howard was running and there's a lot of attention on the Green Party and it became very important for us to find a way to fulfill our mission without a plethora of candidates. It's very hard to run in 2020 because it's the spoiler, the spoiler accusation can be very powerful to those of us who are not um, inoculated against it. Um, so we decided that it was time for us to focus on the levers of power within our state that were accessible even if we're not elected. We started look, looking at legislation, how we can uh, kind of move that legislation around understanding the systems of our state so that we could have a better control, a, a better uh, way of accessing it, and furthermore, so that we would have a better understanding so that when we send people to our state legislature, to our state senate, they have an idea of how this works and, and so they won't get rolled. And um, working on ranked choice voting, I really emphasize that to me. It, it really is a matter of being able to reach out across the different partisan design, the divides and working with other groups in places that you can work with them. Um, the, the Libertarians and the Greens, we don't agree on a lot. But one thing that we agreed on uh, around 20 years ago before I joined the party was the party was agreed on a ballot am amendment that passed uh, right before the turn of the century. And it's the reason that the Greens don't have to fight for ballot access every single year. The Greens and Libertarians worked together and they passed a ballot amendment where they could work together to basically say that if you gain ballot access here in the state of Florida as a party, keep on your paperwork regularly and you will be a party. So politics are flash, or politics elections are, are flash and they're big and they're great. They're the way to bring people into the party. But even if you can't run for office, if you won't run for office, there are a lot of things that you can do in your state, um, especially in something like ranked choice voting, where people are, 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 are open to it, they're listening, that you can still have an impact even if you don't have people in office. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you to our panelists. Um, this session ends at 3.20, so we, it's just um, a few minutes to three, so we have some time for questions. 
there is one that was already in the chat, so I'll read that um, from Deborah, uh, and then people can write stack in the chat, and we can have you answer your ask your questions. Uh, Howie, can we abolish the filibuster that originates in the 18th century? Who is responsible for over the course of time to brainwash the public to think there is only one? There are two political parties in this country. Is it the two parties or the board of elections? So I don't know, Howie, that was directed to you, but I'm sure if the other panelists have some comments, they can do that. The Democrats can abolish the filibuster. The senators can do it with Harris providing the tiebreaker. They could do it in 10 minutes from now by having a vote and they can change the Senate rules. They could do it partially so they could get the voting rights legislation passed before the People Act in the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. But they didn't, and they're not, because Biden won't push it. And all, although we know about cinema and mansion, Washington Post has been surveying these senators. There's about a dozen Democrats that don't want to get rid of the filibuster. So who could do it? The Democrats could. They're not going to do it. So we're not going to get voting rights or any of the other reforms they ran on. And that's why we need the damn Green Party. Now, why does the country think we're a two-party system? Corporate media only covers the two parties. Uh, I've been out there petitioning for years. I used to, in New Hampshire, 30 years ago, people would say, this is a two-party country. You can't, you can't petition to put the Green Party on the ballot. I mean, people have been imbibed this. So I think it's, it's in the air. And the big thing that reinforces that is this single member plurality voting we're talking about. Because even if people say, well, I'd like to vote for a third party, but this year, you know, everybody who is at all progressive minded, except for about 400,000 of us, voted for Biden to stop Trump. And you can understand why. Trump was scary. You know, my answer was Biden was no answer and we're seeing that right now. But that voting system, you know, we've had, uh, something like 46 presidential elections since they first tallied the popular vote. And third parties on the left first ran the Liberty Party, Abolitionist Party, 1840. And only f f four or five times have the independent left party got more than 4%. Free soilers twice, populist once, socialist once, and progressives once. And that was a century ago. The incentives particularly in a high stakes race like president in this two party or this single member plurality system uh, are really powerful. 19 of the 50 presidents elected since they tallied didn't get a majority of the vote. Five of them came in second in the popular vote. I mean, our, it's a farcical system, yet that's where the incentives are. So, you know, you get people thinking, well, yeah, we like what the Greens say, the polls show our positions are more popular than the Democrats and Republicans. That's why, they, you know, I think they're really afraid of us because they know in a fair election system, there'd be a lot of us in office. It'd change the whole thing. So that two party system is entrenched in people's minds and reinforced by the voting system. I have a few other questions. I have a few other questions that have already come in, Howie, if you okay. uh, have time to. Um, Okay, well, I'm gonna call on Bill uh, Balderson first. He, he has to be on stack and then I'll keep going. Please mute uh, if you're not speaking. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And I apologize, I had intended to be here at the beginning, but I had a, a medical appointment I had to deal with today. Um, my question is this, uh, and maybe it's been well covered. I, I come from Oakland and I'm sure as was reported the Bay Area you know, putting aside Utah, the Bay Area um, is probably the highest concentration of, of ranked choice of voting uh, uh, cities, uh, not only San Francisco, uh, but my own town in Oakland. And it's been progressing San Leandro and more recently Albany and uh, other fairly near locations have done it in an advisory way. And I'm, I'm assuming it was reported uh, earlier that Gavin Newsom had voted against uh, the uh, proposal when it first came up in San Francisco and that he vetoed a bill that would have made it a statewide uh, possibility. Uh, but my question is this, 
Um, as much as we talk about uh, RCV, and rightly so, because it's perhaps much more attainable than so many other things, um, I'm curious if there there's been discussions other places nationally about proportional representation. The one most famous example uh, on a local level uh, was uh, New York City in the in the 40s. Uh, and uh, but uh, just a quick anecdote. I don't want to take up too much time. I, I brought up a motion some years back, 15 years back, at the um, convention of the National Education Association, the largest union in the United States, and probably the most heavily wed to the Democratic Party, um, at our General Assembly, a representative assembly, um, about a study on proportional representation. Um, and at first, it looked like it was going to pass. And then someone got up and said, we can't do this. The Democrats will get angry. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you know of any efforts on, uh, on a local level to experiment with proportional representation. Does anybody on the panel want to speak to yeah. that yet? Or? Sure, in um, Minnesota, there are some races that have proportional representation and many city councils, there's an opportunity for, and there are some that have there are some city councils that have it. And so our um, strategy in Colorado is to get rank choice uh, in more cities so people become familiar with it. But when there are at large seats, there will be um, rank choice will use, will have proportional representation. Well, that gets the clerks running it. They know they can do it. There's the voter education, it's proven. And then our um, longer plan is to then move to having, after we have ranked choice passed uh, in statewide elections, to then have an initiative for proportional representation for uh, representatives going to our state legislature and for our um, delegation going to the US House of Representatives. So that, that is the pathway to uh, proportional representation is start at the city council levels because that gets the clerks using it and understanding how it works. Otherwise they'll say, we can't do it. But when you say your colleague two towns over did it, then they understand because it's coming from their regular channel of communication that they trust. And we've got um, proportional rank choice voting, proportional representation in three cities uh, recently initiated by ethnic minorities that were excluded from representation. Rose Point, uh, Michigan, it was African-Americans. Desert Palm, California, it was Latinos. And right there by you in uh, Oakland, in Albany, it was Asian-Americans. And it was either litigation, which was Gross Point, or the threat of litigation in civil rights activism. And that Proportional representation became the remedy for the exclusion of these ethnic minorities. And that's historically what, when we had proportional representation in 24 cities in the progressive era, it created multi-party and multi-racial democracies. And then they got repealed in the McCarthy era like Linda was talking about. That's what we got to bring back. And New York City, first black was elected, Adam Clayton Powell running on a third party ticket, uh, American Labor Party first women elected to the city council when they had proportional representation in 1937 to 1945. Thank you. Uh, in the Dave Schwab asked a question. I don't know, Dave, if you feel you've got your answer in the chat or we can hear for everybody, which says um, uh, in terms of um, fractional versus random votes, uh, when, um, oh, that's sorry, that's Linda's answer. So, uh, Dave's question was, um, with overvotes, wouldn't it be fair to count a fraction of everyone's second choice rather than randomly selecting some ballots to get their second choice counted? I don't know, Linda, if you want to expand on that. Some people may be on the phone and not see the chat. Oh, okay. So um, real quick, we leave that to the clerks to figure out. Uh, most, most of the computer systems that run single transferable vote do it fractionally. 
So I, um, but there is a, a short list of different ways it can mathematically get done. And it is, um, we, we stay agnostic to it and let the clerks handle it because um, that's what gets the clerks on our side is that we say, you know, they are overtaxed workers or who are like given so much to do, they can figure it out. You know, exactly how they do it is up to them. But yes, usually it is fractional. But we don't use the word fraction when talking to regular voters because heads explode. Uh, and a follow up question from Dave, and then we'll go back to Deborah is, is there a gold standard software to calculate the transfers? Um, you know what, they all have it. And there is some that is uh, free that was put together by um, RCD Resource Center. It's open source, the universal tabulator. And that's what um, the uh, software companies use as their model. That's what they're copying and pasting from and then selling at a higher rate. And, you know, again, that's for the clerks to figure out which um, vendor they want to go to. Great, thanks. And uh, before we go to another question, just a shout out. Uh, it is in the chat, but uh, Craig Catano from New Jersey, um, he is, along with another Green, one of the founding members of Ranked Choice New Jersey. So there are Greens leading this kind of nonpartisan effort around the country. So it's great for people to connect that way. Um, and let me get back to Deborah's question. How come some environmental conservative groups like Sierra Club only endorse Democratic candidates? Ah, the big question. Many of us as candidates have been asked. Is it because they get donations from them and how do we change that? Well, in my opinion, it's their mentality. Sierra Club uh, are mostly, you know, liberal reformers and Democrats look like the best shot. Um, but there are exceptions. I've got endorsements from Sierra Clubs. Um, if you're a credible candidate and you know the local people, one good thing about Sierra Club is a membership organization. They vote on leadership, they vote on their positions. It's not like these top-down nonprofits. So actually Sierra Club is like a union. We got a fighting chance. But generally, the billionaires fund these nonprofits and the progressives got their billionaires. And then the deal is you got to be oriented to the Democratic Party and steer people there. But I don't think that works so much in the Sierra Club because it's a membership organization. Although we do know back when Carl Pope was running it uh, and they were pushing natural gas as the bridge to the renewable future, Sierra Club got $25 million from the natural gas industry. Anybody else on the panel want to comment about that? Yeah, so I mean, um, the endorsements, um, the thing is to get them to rank the endorsements. Uh, it would be preferable if they would say, um, you know, Green Party first, another candidate second, but even including us at all is good because it directs attention to our candidates. And yeah, also to reinforce what Howie said, um, a lot of these organizations are top down where you have um, leadership that enjoys his connections to uh, power and don't wanna lose that. If you um, endorse a green, then you're gonna lose power with both Democrats and the Republicans. And uh, perhaps that's something that you fear. Great. And just a shout out uh, from Cindy Matthews uh, about Ranked Choice Ohio. So yet another, a state that's doing some work that Greens, Greens are involved in. Um, are there any other questions for the panel? You can put Stack in the chat. You can just unmute and say Stack. We'll make sure everybody gets a chance. We have about 10 minutes left. Well, while we're waiting on a question, uh, could I say a few words about the New York City ranked choice voting primary? Sure. Uh, for the voters, they liked it. There was an exit poll, 95% of the voters said the ballots were simple to use. 77% said they wanna keep doing ranked choice voting. You may have seen the Right Wing Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, Wall Street Journal, uh, some Black and Latino and Asian Democrats on the council that don't want competition because in single member plurality, you can say you're splitting the black vote. 
in a ranked choice vote, you can have competition among black voters and you can rank them one, two, three. And they don't want the competition. That's where that's coming from. And you've heard a lot of negative things. The problem in New York was we got a, we got a terrible New York City Board of Election based on patronage, nepotism, incompetence, ineptitude. You know, like Bernie Sanders, they purged 200,000 voters in that 2016 primary. They put uh, 100,000 uh, mistaken absentee ballots out in 2020. They keep making these stupid mistakes. So that's why you're getting a lot of complaints, but the, the voters liked it. Now, the problem for the Greens is this is a partisan piece of legislation. It only covers primaries and special elections. General election, they're back to plurality voting. So the Greens don't get the benefit of removing the spoiler problem. And that was very conscious. I know one of those people on the uh, Charter Commission, Sal Albanese, he told me that's why they did it. And I know one of the lawyers that was counsel. The other thing they could have done, like Bill Balderson raised, was go to proportional ranked choice voting for the city council. And they got testimony that that's how New York City used to do it. But the Democrats, who have 48 to 51 uh, members of the city council, appointed 14 of the 15 charter commissioners and have every citywide office, didn't want competition from the Greens. So that's why you have this partisan law. So, you know, our task in New York is to extend ranked choice voting to the general and make it proportional for city council. So the voters liked it, and hopefully we can build upon that to expand it so it includes all the parties. Thank you, Howie. Any other questions or comments or comments from um, our other panelists as we wrap up? Or Linda Lebeau, did you want to give any final comments? Okay, well, thank you so much for having, um, having Lebeau and I, I won't speak for Lebeau, but I'm very grateful to be here and talking to you all. And uh, thank you for sitting through the, uh, the weeds of it. It's important to, um, that our activists know how that works, how ranked choice works because the opposition works on confusion and this the um, now nonsense is an infinitely renewable resource and it gets promulgated at the Center for Election Science. Look out for them and um, I'll be uh, hopefully getting in touch with everyone with resources that you can use in your own state. And please talk to your friends, talk to your, your frenemies, talk to your allies. Now is really the time for this movement. You'll be surprised um, if you get out there and begin talking to people how much fertile ground there is. Even if you think you live in a uh, desolate political wasteland, you may be surprised. The last thing I'd like to say is what I said at the beginning. I urge Greens to put Democrats on the spot. Everybody knows the Republicans are making all these anti-democratic moves. But the Democrats are the party of party suppression, which is a form of voter suppression. So all our candidates, they should challenge the Democrat they're running against, get behind the fair ballot access. If it's Congress, there's federal legislation, if it's state legislation, and for proportional representation. And if they won't get behind those, the Greens should say, we're pulling your progressive card because you're an autocrat, because you're for party suppression, which is what they do in autocratic states. I think we got to really push hard on this issue because while the Republicans are getting all the attention, the Democrats are complicit. They can't even remove the filibuster to get the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed. So we got to call them out on that. And that's why we need to run against both parties. Great. Well, thank you uh, to our speakers. Thank you to our participants who um, not only asked some great questions, but also shared what they're doing in their states and their localities. And uh, maybe this is time for the National Party to talk about even having a national call in where states can all talk about the initiatives and the way to share that. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.